Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the brain behind the game, brain game tennis, Craig O'Shaughnessy. I like to bring Craig on after tournaments. Uh, to discuss statistically what happened, tactically what happened. And, um, you know, he's one of the best in the business, worked with Novak Djokovic for years. So, Craig, thanks for coming on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. We're in the middle of a couple of big tournaments. One's done, so we can go back and take a look at that, see what happened, and then project a little bit uh, to Miami over the next couple of weeks. So let's talk tennis. So I I must admit, I was a the the – the Indian Wells final between Alcaraz and Medvedev was slightly anticlimactic. I think very, really, very. Right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I watched it from beginning to end, and I think tactically uh, there were some things that I thought Alcaraz did that maybe he's probably one of two or three people on tour can do to Medvedev. That's number one. Mm-hmm. But also Medvedev's spirit. Yeah. It looked like yeah, he was in it, so that made me go back and look at his draw to see was he a little beat up? Did he have a tougher role? Which probably he did. What did you take from that final? What stood out? Yeah, well, I think one of the graphics I saw before it, you know, time on court. Um, I think Alcaraz was something from memory around six hours, and Medvedev was like fourteen hours. <laughs> so I, I, looked, I thought that might have been a typo, but. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Daniil got banged up with some injuries. Um, he got banged up mentally with the, the speed of the court being so slow. He made his way through that. He battled his way through that. Um, but when it got to the final, it was one of those matches, you know, at some stage when you and I are sitting watching a match and let's say we've got $100 each. And at some stage we've got to go, um, I don't know who I'm going to put that $100 on yet, but let's get to a stage. It may be the end of the first set. It may be the second set. It may be at the start of the third set. We don't know. But after a handful of points, maybe even a game, that $100 in my hand says, bang, I'm on Alcaraz today. He looked fresher. I think you're exactly right in saying the word spirit. Some days we come out and we're flatter. Some days we come out and the energy is not there as as much as you prepared exactly the same way. Um, It was windy. It was a little chilly. And Daniil didn't have his mojo from the very first game. So that's that's how things slide sometimes. Yeah, I think that he let the speed of the court annoy him from the very first round, right? And it's one of those things that, Obviously, he's a Grand Slam champion, but some can argue that he should have won more already, right? Mm-hmm. And when you when you are a, t- a bit temperamental uh, and unable to accept things you cannot change, they do sort of catch up to you eventually when you do get late in the tournament and playing too far. But I think one of the things that really uh, a different dimension Alcaraz showed me was this. We know Medvedev likes to camp out on the back fence. Al Karen, and we don't advise people to serve wide, you know, serve and volley wide, right? Because you got all kinds of angles that you cannot cover. Al Karen showed me the ability to hit a flat serve, short and wide, mm-hmm. and get in, and then hit a short volley, right? And I think what she, over and over again on the do side, he ate Medvedev up with that one play. And it showed me two things. A, the speed in which he can get from the baseline to the net, right? We knew he was fast left and right. Laterally, we know he comes a lot of ground. But I always thought TFO was quick getting in. Alcaraz is a different level of getting in. And you saw that when he served in volley. Mm-hmm. Um, and what shocked me about that is Medvedev never adjusted. A couple steps forward. Right. On the wide serve in particular, could have took that away. Right. You know, you know, because there were some games that were 30 all chances to get back on serve, make it a little bit interesting. But lack of adjustments mm-hmm. on obvious, clear, mm-hmm. boys 16's tactics. Mm-hmm. That's what said, okay, a spirit isn't it. 
because that was an adjustment I think I would expect Daniil to make, and normally he does make. Yeah. So um, Carlos Carlitos won nine of 10 serving and volley. There was other points, another handful of points where he served in volley, but it was a fault. So that would have been higher had he made that serve. Um, certainly his ability to get in and then just dump a volley is good. He won seven of 11 uh, with drop shots. That's not including the drop volley. It's just a regular drop shot. Five of those were a clean winner. Uh, he, and I saw one graphic. It was right at the start of the match. Tennis, uh, well, Tennis TV did a great job with this, with Hawkeye, where they, they looked in the ad court and they said, okay, if the serve goes down the tee to Medvedev and he touches it here versus the serve goes wide and he touches, touches it way over there, the difference was about 10 metres. So the, from singles line to singles line on a tennis court, it's, it's not quite 10 metres. <laughs> it's actually closer. It's actually closer from doubles line to doubles line. So just imagine this. Medvedev standing back there. He's got to run just to return the serve. He's got to run doubles line to doubles line, potentially. That's the, that's the width that he is opening up by standing so far back. The obvious, I sat with Tim Henman in Miami last year, um, watching players play Medvedev. And uh, it was actually, uh, yeah, watching Medvedev and watching um, Kasper Ruud. And he's like, back in our day, you know, Rafter and I, we would, we would be almost leaning over the net. We would get in so quickly against these guys. It is so obvious that you must serve and volley. And it is shocking that he didn't know. Well, actually, he did know it was coming, but he didn't, like you said, he didn't adjust. Maybe after two or three serve and volleys, he stands on the baseline and takes it away. Then he moves back. Then he moves up. And he's, he's engaged and he's making Carlos react to him. Didn't see it. Yeah. The other thing I thought was interesting was in the middle of a rally, right? And when I'm not talking about off an approach shot, I'm talking about from a baseline forehand, two to four feet behind the baseline, how quickly Carlito is able to get to the net from that position. Yeah. Not from a, not from a short ball, ball that's in you know, no man's land, mm -hmm. right? Or a semi short ball. I'm talking about from a normal ground stroke observing Daniil's court position being far back. And by the time the ball was on Daniil's racket, Carlito was already at the net. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, that is A, decisive, and B, so quick mm -hmm. from two to, two to four feet behind the baseline to two to four feet inside the net. And I thought that was like, wow, that's quick. And I think the one thing that I think made, made sets him apart from TFO, because TFO did some good things about against Medvedev as well. Yes. But when you look at Alcaraz, when he tried to hit short, you see a lot of players, young players, hit the ball in the net when they try to hit short because they try to hit too short, mm -hmm. right? Carlito didn't do that. Mm -hmm. He did not, you know, have the ill-advised drop shot that drops in the ball in the net because you make it too good. It showed his ability to use the front part of the court responsibly, mm -hmm. very maturely, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas some players, like maybe a TP, or a TFO, we see him go for the drop shot at, at, a, at the right time, but just make it too good. Carlos didn't do that. He was not intimidated mm -hmm. by Medvedev's speed, nor do I think Medvedev was there to even bring that speed to the match. I don't mm -hmm. think he was like mentally present to see it coming, right? And so I thought there was three dimensions, serving volley, uh, the ability to move from two to four feet behind the baseline to two to four feet behind the net, and then his ability to use the short part of the court way more responsibly than anybody in his age group. Mm -hmm. Those are things that I saw I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty good. And I think that exposed Medvedev's um, sort of surrender of court position. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. The, the anticipation as well, as you talked about being in that two to four foot range behind the baseline, moving wherever he wants to move to, going cross quarter down the line with outstanding balance, and then recognizing that the opponent may take a big step, the opponent may take a hand off the racket. He sees that so early, and then he jumps on that. And, you know, I had a, um, I did a, I do some Zoom lessons, some Zoom strategy lessons. I had one this morning with a gentleman in Connecticut, and we were talking about anticipation. 
And so we were reviewing his match and he was about ready to hit a ball. And I paused it and I said, look, watch the opponent down the other end is moving before you hit the ball. That's what you need to look at. So as an experiment, I said, only stare at the ball as it's coming over, but look at the opponent out of your peripheral vision. And he did it. And for the first time, he's like, oh, that's how it works. So <laughs> I'm focused on the ball, but I still see the opponent. And I think some players have it, some don't. And Carlitos has it in spades. Yes, yes. And, and, and for those at home, you know, your, your, your coach always says you keep your eye on the ball, right? Keep it. But at this level, you've got to do multiple things at one time. You've got to be laser focused on the ball and the contact point. But you also have got to recognize movements. Right. And, and oh, lean of the shoulder. The, <laughs> you gotta do it. You know. You have to. And and he and he proves that he that he that he does it extremely well. Now let's go back to the time on court piece because I think um the way that Alcaraz handles his first round opponents is one that I think Zverev and Medvedev are going to have to sort of take a page out of his book and adjust because Mev, I mean, Zverev is famous for in a slam surviving a five set scare in round yeah. one or round two. And eventually that catches up to him, right? If you look at Medvedev, perhaps two, you know, a couple of his matches went to five and four, went to the third set. They probably shouldn't have had to. And it was fine up until you reach a, a fresh Carlo because yeah. Carlos is not going to make that same mistake. He yeah. will be waiting for you at the final with fresh legs. Yeah. And if you are going to get there, meet him and compete, you better win the matches you're supposed to win in the time you're supposed to win them. Yeah. You can't waste an extra hour on court, extra five hours on court, and think you're going to be ready for this young gun at the end of the tournament. So I think that will the days of let them hold, let them hold, let them hold, let them hold. I'll break. You know what I mean? I'll wait to six all to break. I'll wait to five all to break. Those days are going to be over if if these next if this next generation is going to compete with Alcaraz because it's just going to keep them on the court in a place like Miami that's hot, that's humid. It's just not going to work. He's going to be sitting there waiting on you like lunch meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I completely agree with that, and um, you know. Carlitos set the stage early on against Medvedev yesterday with some, some longer bruising rallies where Medvedev was back on the Indian Wells sign and Carlos is up on the baseline and it's just banging, and banging, and banging. And, 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 you know, you could feel it's like, well, you know, the 19-year-old the Spaniard is going to do this all day long. How is Medvedev going to get a ball past him? Because, you know, yes, the air is quick out there, but as soon as it hits the court, it's like glue and it just slows down. And, you know, Alcaraz has just got all day to, to hit the ball. So how are you going to hurt him? Right. Right. Tough. Yeah. And I also think it was a missed opportunity for TFO. I think Medvedev was having a very testy tournament. Yeah. And I feel like TFO is a missed opportunity for him yeah. uh, in the semifinal against Medvedev. That was a match TFO could have and probably should have won. So now let's look at Miami. Yes. I don't recall the last man to win the Sunshine Double. What do you think of Alcaraz's chances? I will take him and I'll give you the field. <laughs> well, let me just say this. I think that, I mean, you know, having played the Indian Wells, um, I think there are some people in his way that are playing well, namely Tommy Paul. Yes. I think Maxim Creasy will keep him on the court in the third round a very long time. Okay. Uh, and I think Tommy isn't as athletic as Alcaraz, but he's up there now. I mean, the speed. What, what round would, would that be? Paul? That would be in the fourth round. Fourth round, okay. Fourth round. I'm, I'm, I think Tommy Paul, to me, is my pick to end the streak. Mm. Um, he got the athleticism, he's got the hands, he's got the touch. He lives down there, he loves that environment. Yeah. That is, I I just don't I don't know that he can do it and win that many matches in a row. And so I'm picking Tommy Paul to take him out. Okay. Um, I'm still gonna stay with with Carlos there. I think I I think 
back end to back end, things will be fine. The, the, the guys will bang away. I just think Carlitos is, gets his forehand through the court a little bit more. Um, you know what I like about Tommy and also with Francis? Th these guys have this ability to come around the ball. It's something we used to talk about, like go back to the 70s, you know, hitting the outside of the ball. We'd talk about that all the, all the time. You know, I was young then. I, but you, you heard it. You heard, you know, that, that kind of talk. And, you know, both Tommy and, um, and Francis have this really nice ability to hit the shorter angle forehand and, and make it run. And, and make the player stretch. And that certainly, let's say he does, does cause an upset there. He will have to hit that shot well to stretch him off the court. Because what happens, you know, if, if there is a chink in the Alcaraz armor, he, there's, there's not many balls that he sees that he says, I, I can hit this. I can hit this one. And I can hit that one. And I can hit that one. And if you can get him into a defensive position, he'll try and hit his way out of it more than he'll try to defend his way. Now, Novak will recognize the defense and play defense and, and stay alive. Whereas Carlos is a little bit more about, I, I think I can rip this still. So <laughs> if Tommy can come around that forehand and pull him off the court, the stretching wide forehand potentially could be a, a hot spot in that match. Yeah. And then I think center. I think we, besides Alcaraz, center is playing exceptionally well. Yeah. I think he's in a part of the draw where, you know, he gets past Vera, uh, which I think he can. Yeah, uh, and will. Agreed. Um, And then it could be either Paul or Alcaraz in that semifinal there. Uh, so center is definitely one I think we should watch. My dark horse, my my breakout player for this tournament, if we can consider it to be a breakout, would be Ben Shelton. If you look at his draw. Read it out. Who we, what, what do we got? Ben Shelton, he's got. Manorino or Zhang. Then he's got Hubie Hercox. Ooh. Then he's got Chorich or Nori. And let me tell you, I think all of those matches he can win. I th so I watched him play Taylor Fritz live right behind in like the yeah. expensive seats, you know, yeah. uh, Larry and Bill and all those seats back there. And the game is so easy to him. His serve yeah. is so big. I think that um, he's a big boy that's also quick. He's unafraid. Florida's his place. Florida's his place, right? Maybe his dad drives up for a match, right? It's not that far. Um, but I think if he can just hold it together, I think he had a, missed a real opportunity to be Taylor Fritz. Yeah. And it yeah. was like four all in a second. 30 all there was a semi short ball that Ben Shelton just did not get his feet up to the ball uh dumped the forehand in the bottom of the net and it was a total missed opportunity for him mm. I think he learned from that I think he knew how many yeah. he had four different chances to be Taylor Fritz in the yeah. second set. um I think he learned from that I also think that his feet got a little heavy he started chipping too much when he got a little tight right I think he immediately learns from that uh, and I think he's going to, you know, obviously get, so I think he's going to get quarters. I think he's going to yeah. get quarters. the energy. I, I like that. that. That all makes sense. And especially the Florida connection. He, he feels very much at home there. Um, boy, has he got a monstrous game. And, you know, just imagine in a year or two when he matures and you've got Alcaraz and you've got Sinner and you've got a couple of other guys, TFO, you know, pressing through as well. Um, and Holger Room, you know, you always got to put him there. So, a very exciting time. And, you know, Ben, you know, the, the, at, at Australia, he played so well. It's just that he ran out of steam against Tommy with his backhand. You know, Tommy just prayed on the backhand. And I don't know whether he had a bad backhand day or or it just, you know, it, it can go away. I don't, I don't know that. I want to see more. But I agree with you. Unbelievably exciting player. Now, what I, I saw on social media today, he switched um, – clothing companies, Iga Sviatek, the number one woman, and him, they're now wearing the on, and it looks yeah. great on them in yes. the pictures. Yes. I think what, what a great move to bring on into the clothing area in tennis. Yeah. So let me ask you this. What do you think makes him so good, Ben? He's the, stroke, the stroke still could be a little more refined, right? It could be cleaner. You could tell 
he got, you know, he didn't start playing at six years old and like sort of fully commit to the game that young. Um, but to be this good with so many things that he could improve upon, what do you think makes them so tough? Um, the thing that I saw in Australia, especially watching him close there, was fearless. That I put that as number one. In any particular moment, if the ball was there to be hit, he was hitting the ball. Um, and and that's, that's just how he approaches his game. And I love that about him. There was no backing off. You know, I, I think it was very sensible shot selection. Maybe a couple of times, you know, he's young. He, he went a little big at the wrong time. But in general fearless to hit the shot that needs to be hit at that moment in time. Um, the serve is massive. Uh, his motion is, is just electric, you know, jumping up into the court. His forehand is big. His energy, I would say, um, you know, the, the energy is really good. The fearlessness is really good. I thought the attitude, I, I, didn't, I haven't seen yet any, anything that I would – so I don't really like that. Um, and his ability to play through people, he's got to, you know, he, he can just go right through you. He can go through you with the serving, go through you with the return. He can really go through you with the forehand. And for the most part, he can go through you with the backhand. And he's fearless. And he's got good energy. And he smiles. And he's having fun. And he's young. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no, I haven't, I haven't, you know, just Tommy Paul exposed the backhand in that match. That's the only thing that I've seen during those three sets. Well, let me ask you the one player you think is missing an opportunity. I've got one player in my mind that I think is missing this opportunity with no no back. At the moment? Yes. Okay, so I'm just, uh, you know, maybe I I'm looking at it, you know, Casper Root's kind of gone away on the hard courts. He'll find himself when he gets on a clay. Um, Stefanos. That's mine. Yeah. That's mine. I think Stefanos, he's sitting at three in the world. Um, Total missed opportunity. I yeah, mean, just, I agree. Yeah, you know, maybe he's not 100% healthy, but when you think you got two 1000s on courts that, you know, theoretically sort of fit your game style, and A, talking, I would say, negatively or very passively in the media about your chances to win that doesn't help uh that's like making yourself look like lunch meat to the whole field but be maybe not not being 100 percent or not doing the things leading up to it to be 100 percent, if at all possible yeah um i mean i think this was this was a really missed opportunity for him yeah with no novak yeah agreed you know absolutely, absolutely. i mean this, this was his chance right and then look after this event Back in Europe, Novak is back, and then he starts to spread the lead. And Novak's, you know, I, I Novak has never. He's just a quick side side by here. 2018, he wins the final at the U.S. Open. You know, 2017, he finished. He finished halfway through. His elbow was bad. Didn't play the rest. Started 2018 was really bad. He was thin. He was skinny. He he wasn't. He didn't have a tennis body anymore. And then he wins 2018 U.S. Open. He comes off the court from Del Potro. I'm one of the first guys there. I hug him. I felt like I was hugging this pen. You know, it's like he's so tall and skinny. And I'm like, there's not, there's not a lot of you. Right. Um, and but now, my God, I look at him in uh, in Melbourne. He he has more muscle on his body right now than I've ever seen him have at any stage of his career. He's used this time away to hit the gym, to beef up. He's stronger in the legs. He's stronger in the upper body. He, the shirt fits him perfectly. Um, and, and that's why he's hitting the ball bigger because he's got more muscle. He's hitting his forehand much bigger than he ever has. And, you know, he's, he's, he's just so strong. He's anti-aging like a madman. And if you think you're gonna, he's going to go away on the clay, there's just no chance that's going to happen. No chance. Yeah, like when I look at what, what is happening right now, I think that um, if Novak uses this time, or you, which I'm sure he did, right, a little vacay, but then back to training, we're going to, I mean, the field is going to be in trouble. When yeah. we get the European swing in a couple of weeks, French Open, Wimbledon, see what happens with the U.S. Open. But yeah. I think between the French Open and Wimbledon, he gets the next two slams because time off for a person that mature that committed mm -hmm. to himself, to the game, and to making history, 
is dangerous for the other field. And that is why I think Tissipas missed an opportunity. Because yeah. this guy's just recharging. He's not on vacation. He's recharging, right? right. And it's gonna, he's going to spread this lead between himself and whoever's number two and number three at the time. It's just, it's just no chance. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I really agree with that. I think he's going to be so strong. The fact that Rafa's, you know, Rafa's struggling. Let's see, you know, Rafa typically, when he wins Roland Garros, he's typically had a really good run into Roland Garros. It may start late, but, you know, he's going to win Monte Carlo. He goes to Barcelona and wins it most of the time. He goes to Madrid. That's the tougher one. He goes to Rome and, and does great. And that lead up builds massive confidence and the aura. And everybody's running scared by the time he hits Paris. Whereas Rafa, by, by being out injured, injured makes it a little tougher. So I don't, I don't know, um, you know, if Novak's fearing Rafa as much. The, th- the only guy to fear at the moment is Alcaraz. That's the only guy. Well, how do you how do you think they fare up? I know they had a run in last year, in Madrid. How do you think Novak measures up to Alcaraz? I mean, they're very similar. Very, right? Alcaraz is just fifty years older, right? It's very similar. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but Alcaraz has got youth on the side. Yeah, I, I think you know Novak being stronger now, especially on the forehand wing, he can, you know. There was a time I remember way back when, like 2000 and I don't know, five or six, I remember going to the Australian Open and seeing Leighton Hewitt, who I hadn't seen in a few months, bulked up. You know, he's got the cutoff shirt, he's got the guns, and it's like, oh, that's in direct reference to beat Roger Federer. He needed more beef on his body. He needed to be able to withstand and he needed to be able to hurt. And you know, it, it, it just kind of begs the question in my mind, this, this time has been perfect for Novak to go away, but is it also this extra muscle in response to Carlitos and not being pushed around the baseline um, by a 19-year-old? You know, it, it certainly makes sense. It certainly makes sense. But I think, you know, backhand to backhand, the guys are, are so good. You know, what I marvel about Carlitos is that how balanced he is, like he, and, and Novak the same. They just rip the ball, and they're so still. Right. Their timing is impeccable. Yeah. So, um, you know, they're basically mirror images of each other. You know, uh, uh, Carlos does have a better drop shot. Novak, um, Carlos is better at serving and volleying on clay. I think. I think I'd, I'd, I'm happy to say that. Um, but you know, Novak has the experience. Novak has you know, playing for history. Um, and he's also up for the challenge. It's like, this is the best young guy at the moment. Bring him on. Let's yeah. see what he's got. Yeah. So, it, it, yeah. it, man, the more they, the more matches those two play, the better our sport is going to be. Yeah, and you know, I think Novak has a luxury right now of sitting at home watching him. You're right. And You're getting right. ready. He's watching yeah. him, right? Studying, oh. studying, oh, yeah. putting it away. yeah. The whole team, he's like, all right, guys, you guys better sit and watch this and figure something out. Yeah. Right? Now, we got we got to touch base on the women, right? So I want to yes. go back to the women, Indian Wells. You know, 2018, 2019, I thought women's tennis was more to be successful. A, you had to make balls, and B, just be opportunistic, right? So like the Halops, the Sloans. You know, that style was winning. Coco came in very similar, right? Defense first, offense when you opened it up for, right? Sure. And when you look at, let's say, Q, Q4 Q of last year, Q1 of this year, it is the opposite of that. It is Sabalinka, Rybakina. And let me just say, it was a great match. I mean, I don't know. I, it was like, who, which one was not going to double fault the daggone match away, right? That was really the question. Um, but I think the person, well, go ahead. Tell me what you thought about the final. And I'll tell you the person that what, lost out on the whole tournament. I didn't watch it. I, <laughs> I, had so, I wish I, well, I watched them in Australia. I, I watched it. It was, was it Australia? It was the same match. Australia? It was the exact same match. Yeah, was it? Okay. That's what uh, I thought. It was That's the exact same match. I mean, I saw it. first set tiebreaker, like 11 all, 9 8, set point, double fall, set point, double fall. Right? It was just, um, it was interesting. It was it was yeah. really interesting. I don't know if it was fear or respect for the opponent's ability to return, 
um, or just, you know, yeah, good old, well, good old playing tight. Yeah, yeah, that happens. I mean, um, you know, Serena. So this is how Serena dominated her entire career. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the point with my serve, or I'm gonna end the point with my return. And these two ladies are, are doing a very similar thing. Sabalenka, a little bit more exactly the same. Rybakina, her ability to step in, is particularly on second serve returns, and just be clean and bang, and it's gone. Um, is so good, but you know, it's I, I love women's tennis right now. I miss the final, uh -huh. um, but I do really enjoy watching them play. I watch them play a lot in Australia. I love that it's that these girls are going after it. I love that it's they're backing themselves, they're trusting their game, they're going for the shots that are there to be hit. And um, you know, especially Alina Rybakina, you know, winning Wimbledon, doing so well there. You know, she's she's always going to be under the radar because her personality is it's low key, it's yeah. it's it's cool, it's it's chill, and it's low key, um, and it's just different. And and so you know, it's not like there's the rah rah isn't there, and you know the electricity maybe isn't there as either either. But you sit down and you watch this young lady play, and I, I think she does an outstanding job. And for Sabalenka. To get through those double fault woes somewhat it's you know they'll still be there a little bit um until it's fully worked out but her ability to bring the passion to the sport is great as well so i'm i'm really enjoying it well let me just say this i think this this style that is coming back uh brings me back to one of my favorite players and one of the nicest people on tour petra kvitova yes petra yeah, kvitova i think should have won the event and i'm gonna tell you what i think cost of the event mm -hmm. She had a tough match against Jessica Bagula, where she lost or she won seven, six and a third, 11, nine in the breaker. OK, Jessica beat her up, even though Jessica lost. Jessica beat her up. Kavitova goes and plays Maria Sakari. Should have won the first set, lost it four six, won the set. I mean, um, should have um, won the first set, six, four. Maria wins the second set, seven, five. Petra should have won that and then lose the third set, six, one. I think from being tired from the night before against Pagula. Yeah. I okay. think if she makes it past Sakari, right, then she beats Abilinka and ultimately will beat Rybakina. But I think the way she was playing, mm. um, she was so confident. I mean, she was hitting the ball so big. Mm. I mean, it was just, and Sabalenka and Rybakina remind me of her. Got right. It. I think it's sort of getting her form back. I think if, if Jessica Pagula had took it easy on her a little bit, then she would have got past the Sakari match. And I think she would have won the tournament. I picked her as watching her play Jesse. I was like, she's going to win this tournament. Mm -hmm. And I just think Sakari kind of pushed her, kept her on the court a little too long. And I think that changed the course of Indian Wales. But I thought she should have won the whole event. Yeah. Maybe Sakari should take Pagula out to dinner in Miami for a few nights in a row. 100 percent 100 take her to a poppy state there we go, there we go. <laughs> so on, on the women's side what do you make of Iga Swiatek? great I, I i'm happy to talk about this because I've, wa I've watched her closely um she's obviously mirrored her game around rafa she idolizes rafa like the rest of us like the rest of us um, but, you know, she's copied the intensity. She's copied the footwork. She's co she's copied everything from Rafa that she possibly could. It's a smart thing. It's great. I love it. Her forehand is the area that falls apart when she when time is taken away. She you know, the grip is around the grip is under the wrist is very active. And if you get that ball in there quickly, she doesn't. Yet, no, and I've been working a lot of this. I don't coach a lot here in Austin, but lately I've been working on this where I've been, I've got two young boys and I've been standing on the same side of the net as them and hammering the ball down into the court and it's coming up quickly to them. And I'm teaching them, they both like to use their wrist a lot, but I'm like, when the ball comes hard and fast, I want you to just kind of keep the wrist still and just come through it and snap on it and be quick. It's a different shot. And, and eager needs the ability to not flick at everything that's coming her way, especially when it comes hard. And if she has forehand defense, the world's her oyster. 
Mm-hmm. But if she doesn't have forehand defense, yeah. you go throw those darts hard at her forehand and, and, and the match is yours. And that's what Robert Keena did. Robert Keena made light work of it, two and two, bang, bang. And I think that Iga is so used to being up on you. Yeah. Right? When you yeah. never get a chance to give her a little extra pop. Yeah. And I think Robert Keena exposed that if you can give her a little extra pace early, yeah. Iga has shown unwillingness to back off the ball. Correct. And I'm not talking about chipping. I'm talking about, oh, wow, that's a good ball. You got me. Let me just roll it up unwillingness in that match to give Robert Keena some respect when she had a little bit of time taken away and just rolled the ball in. And that was like, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Now you got to take your mind to how many people on the women's tour can generate that kind of pace consistently to actually exploit that. It's only probably three or four people. So that's why she sort of got head and shoulders uh, of the field. But you are exactly right. I saw it as unwillingness to surrender. Correct. Correct. Very, very, very. Let's send her a link to this podcast. And and, and the, she's like, those guys have got it figured out. <laughs> I'll invite them. I'll invite them down to the practice court in Miami and they can watch me work, working on it. That'd be. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. And everybody else can send us a hundred bucks for like telling them exactly what to do. There's a few players. I think Pagula can send the ball in there a little quicker. Right. And get up on it. Kavitova can definitely send the ball in there quicker. There's a handful of people who have the game to sort of give her a hard time. Uh, and, and I, Collins. Yeah, and I, I also, th- yes, exactly. And I also think there's there's the power, but there's also the ability to kind of stay up. And I always refer back to Davidenko with this, the ability just to take a ball early and rebound it back and not give you a lot of time. Not the biggest hitter, not the biggest no. guy, but boy, did he he give you as little time as possible to hit a ball. So if you can't, if you recognize you're not, you know, I, I can't go 110 miles an hour on my forehand, but I can play up in the court and I can shorten my backswing a little bit and I can get it back to you and rush you, you can win that match as well. Yeah. All right. So I got to take. So we got your pick for Miami. Yes, you do. That's such a safe pick, Greg. Such a safe pick. <laughs> I'm, going the, I'm going the sunshine double. <laughs> All right. You got, we got your pick there. You got to give me a pick for the women's. With women's tennis now, other than Eagle last year, very few are winning two weeks in a row. So be careful about picking one of those two. I like it. Now, now do you know, have you heard yet the, what, what the speed is down there of the court? I don't. But here's why I think. I think it's not going to be that different than Indian Wells, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. You got thin air, so the ball is moving quick in the air in Palm Springs. Correct, yeah. The court is slow. Even if they speed up the court of Miami, that air, that humidity down there, it is so thick. Mm. I think overall the conditions are going to be almost the same. From a time perspective, I think they're going to even out. Unless they just make them lightning fast, I think they even out. Yeah, good point. It was the same last year. They weren't that fast last year. Yeah. Um, it, it, what I always remember about Miami, uh, that's the only place that I've seen David Ferrer cramp, <laughs> play, playing Murray in the final. I, I see, and that's why Carlos, after playing tough matches in Indian Wells, two or three rounds here, I think he goes down to Tommy. We're gonna. We'll have a. We'll have a quiet. Um, adult beverage on the side while we watch that one. That, and even if he gets fun. past that, he's got center center in the semis. I think he's got a tough role, brother. I don't know about that pick. <laughs> I'm going to go Alcaraz. And I'm going to go Rybakina. Oof. Is it Rybakina? Is it Rybakina? R- Rybakina. 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 Excuse me, Elena. I know, I know right? I'm saying that wrong. Yeah, Rybakina, exactly. Uh, I'm right. going two sunshine doubles. It happens about every 20 years, and we're due. So here I'm, we go. I'm going center. Ooh. And Sviante. Ooh. Okay. Center Sviante. So what we'll do is we'll add up the rounds, how Man. many rounds my players get, combine them, and add up how many rounds your players get and combine them, and that will be our, that will be our bet, a combined bet. Let's do it. This, is, this has been fun, brother. I appreciate you, man. This is the Tennis.com podcast. 
doing a recap of Indian Wells and a preview of Miami. Thank you for listening.